as you know, us interns have been going through the past few weeks discussing different Bible stories and Bible passages that have been really important to us. And um, it, for me, it's not necessarily a passage as much as it is a cycle and a movement that we see playing out in our lives and playing out um, in the passage we're going to read. And so, um, as we go through this, we're going to see um, how Jesus responds to suffering, how Jesus is led into suffering. We're also going to see how I uh, respond to suffering. Um, there, there are a few things you should do, a lot of things you shouldn't do in that, um, but I trust that you guys um, are mature enough and old enough to know like how to sort that out. You know? So we're going to start with reading John chapter, or not John, Luke, that would, that would help, we're Luke chapter 4, verse 1, yeah. and uh, before we get into that real quick, we need a little bit of context. So right before this happens, Jesus is baptized, and in that baptism scene, we see uh we hear God the Father saying, this is my son whom I love. So in that statement, we've already revealed two people of the Trinity, right? Because the Father speaks about his son. You can't be a father if you don't have a son. Like, it doesn't make sense. Uh, secondly, you know, you have Jesus who is called the son, so that's revealed. And then you have uh, the Holy Spirit who comes down on bodily form as a dove onto Jesus. So you have all three people revealed. And that's kind of where we find ourselves. So we see that Jesus full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell the stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world, and he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in your hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Jesus returned to Galilee, and the power of the Spirit and news about him spread through the whole countryside. So before we kind of get into this cycle of suffering, we just kind of need to wrap our head around something real quick. And it's kind of dense. I don't think a lot of us, like, go out into the woods um, and, like, have a conversation with Satan. I don't really think of, like, how we spend our free time. It's kind of bizarre. And in this conversation, um, I think a lot of times we kind of just glance over it and we just think that Satan is, like, poking Jesus and just, like, yo, I bet, like, I, I'm not as cool as you or something. You're like, I bet I'm more powerful than you. That's, they're not really, like, fighting with words. Um, Satan is literally asking Jesus to lay down his life in front of him. Um, and one of the temptations, Satan says, like, hey, worship me. And that word, uh, when it's translated, denotes a posture of, like, laying flat on the ground. And in that culture, when you lay flat on the ground, you expose your neck. And that gives <laughs> the other person the authority to literally chop off your neck and die. Um, Satan also tells Jesus, hey, like, go stand on this really tall building and then jump off and then see if someone will catch you. Right? Uh, Satan is kind of prodding Jesus into trying to commit, like, suicide and to kill himself. So this is kind of dense. We kind of need to wrap our mind around this. So when we look at our cycle, the first thing we see is that we start with awareness, and that's where the baptism of Jesus plays in. Jesus sees this awareness of God the Father and the Holy Spirit being displayed. Uh, he sees a fuller picture of the Trinity, and he's able to see, like, whoa, this is, like, the God that I serve, and this is the God that I obey, and I'm also, like, part of this God because I'm the Son of God. Um, and, and this... For some of us, can look very differently. I think uh, for some of us, this is like listening to a worship song, um, and we get like really connected to it, and we feel like God is really connecting to us, and we see more of God, um, and we just kind of feel like, man, it's a really good song. Um, others of us, maybe we like to go out into nature, and we like to look at uh, like mountains and like flowers, and we see more of God, and we look at that. I think a lot of us can relate to like that spiritual high you get from a camp when you're like, feeling really close to God and everything. That's kind of how my story starts. Um, 
I was at a youth conference, and I felt like God was telling me to scrap my plans. Um, I wanted to be a teacher, and I felt um, like God was calling me to worship ministry and saying, like, Emily, you should not be a teacher. That's not going to go well for you, but maybe you should follow my plan because it's a little bit better. And so when we have this awareness, um, we have to respond. Um, and even a lack of a response is still a response. Like, ignorance is still a response. Uh, when, I, when I was called to ministry at that youth conference, I said, okay, God. Um, and I said, like, I'll scrap my plans, and I will follow you. And we see that Jesus does the same thing. After seeing a picture of who God is in that baptism, Jesus follows the Holy Spirit to the Jordan. He follows the Holy Spirit to the wilderness. Jesus obeys in that moment. But I think that's kind of where this gets confusing, because that obedience leads us to suffering. And I didn't know that when I said okay to God when I obeyed him. Um, so I accepted my call to ministry. I, I said yes. And a few months after that, I started having like really, really bad nightmares. And this isn't like the nightmare you get when you eat like really weird tacos late at night. Um, like, you know, when you have that weird, uh, I don't know, like seasoning and it's like sitting in your stomach. Th those aren't these kinds of nightmares. Um, I had dreams about my friends and family members um, getting like hurt or dying. And then they will like actually happen a few days or weeks later. The first one I had, um, it was about a week before I was supposed to go to youth camp. And when I was going to get to youth camp, my mom would be at a uh, work trip in Denver, Colorado. And I had a dream that while my mom was in Colorado, that she was in a car wreck on I-70 in Denver. And that she was rushed to the ICU. And that upon hearing this news that my dad and my brother left Topeka, uh, and they went straight to Denver, and on their way there, that they were in a car, car crash, um, and that my mom died later in the ICU. Uh, I didn't really think anything of it, and I went to camp, and it's the third night, and worship is about to start, and I get this text on my phone, and granted, I had really, really bad cell service, so all I got was a photo. I didn't get any other information, but in this photo, I saw my mom's car, and the driver's side door was completely smashed in, and right next to her car was a semi-truck that hit her on the highway. I didn't know where my mom was. I mean, obviously she, she sent a text, so I mean, she's probably okay, you know, like she's at least able to text. But for the next two days, I didn't really have any clue as to what the rest of my family members were doing. I didn't know if my dad and my brother left to Denver. I didn't know if my mom was like in a hospital somewhere. And it wasn't until I came home when I saw my whole family get out of the car that I knew they were all okay. And thankfully my mom only left with a minor um, a few weeks later, uh, I had a dream that a girl that I played soccer with, she had cancer, um, and she was like free from her cancer, and uh, I had a dream that the cancer came back and killed her, and three days later, she ended up dying. And so I'm kind of in this place of saying, like, God, I saw you, I know you're good, I know you have plans, and I responded with obedience, and you've just led me to this really, like, terrible place. And I can't see you, I don't see what's good about this, and this doesn't make sense. Like, how are you a good God, but you leave people? to like really, really bad things. And we kind of see Jesus going through this. He saw the Trinity, and he responded in obedience to the Spirit, and he gets led out into the wilderness where Satan is like trying to get him to die, and trying to get him to do all of these really terrible things that he doesn't mean to do. In my story, um, I recognized that, hey, like I needed help, um, so I started praying, and I was like, hey God, like can you fix this? Can you like heal this and just like take it away? And God didn't do that. And I got really frustrated, and I got really angry, and it just drove that question of, like, God, like, how are you good in the midst of it even more? And I was like, you know what, maybe I should read my Bible. So um, I opened up, I tried to read John, and I got to chapter 3, and the image of God was so messed up in my mind that I couldn't read anything without it being just, like, turned completely against me. I started uh, chapter 3, and I got to John 3, 16, when it said, For God so loved the world. But in my mind, it said that, For God so loved everybody else in the world except for Emily. And I felt like God didn't love me. I felt like I wasn't good enough for him. And I felt like I hadn't been doing enough for him. But we see that Jesus shows us a different example. Jesus quotes scripture in response to Satan. And all these scriptures come out of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Um... Our Christian worship is centered around um, Christ, like Christian Christ. And we center it around the death, resurrection, and victory of Jesus Christ. However, before that happened, worship was centered around the Exodus event, when God led the Israelites out of Egyptian oppression. 
And we see that Jesus not only pulls scripture from, from this section, from like the law during this time, but he quotes different events saying like, man shall not live on bread alone, which is a direct reference uh, to God providing food in the wilderness. And we see that since Jesus used scripture, and also uses this element of remembering how God has provided, that he fuels his faith. And all that doubt that he might have is completely eradicated because he remains firm in how God has acted in the past. And we see that because of this, Jesus is victorious. And um, remember in the baptism, the Father says, this is my son whom I love. But Jesus never says that he's a son. It's not until uh, verse uh, 12 in chapter 4 that Jesus said, do not put the Lord your God to the test, where Jesus announces himself as the Lord your God. And so he then begins to reflect that identity. It's not until we recognize our identity as being the daughter and the son of an amazing God, an amazing father, a co-heir with Christ, that we can really step into victory and begin to gain that understanding of what victory looks like. And so we see that Jesus, through his victory, is able to lead and powered by the Spirit. And he goes and he talks to other people. He shares um, with other people about who God is, and he tries to teach them. And we see that suffering isn't, um, isn't a one-time thing. Like, I, as we can see, this is a cycle. We keep going back to it. But Jesus leaves empowered in order to help others. I don't know if you guys have ever watched like the Kentucky Derby or any type of horse races, but horses wear blinders um, because if they don't have them, they get really distracted. And blinders make sure that you can only see what's directly in front of you. If horses are able to see more than that, they'll go like crazy directions and it's just a mess. And I think when we start with our awareness of God, it's like we see this much of who God is and we respond to that. But then we kind of add in this element of suffering. It gets a little wider because now we're like, okay, God, I saw that glimpse of you. I saw it was good and I saw it was loving. But now I'm having to like reconcile this stuff that isn't good and loving in light of what I saw. But when we use scripture and when we use remembrance and we fight, we see that the understanding increases and our blinders continue to expand and we see more of who God is. So what do we do now? Like, how do, how do we do this? Um, so in my story, I had to learn how to read the Bible differently. Obviously, I was reading it wrong. Um, obviously, I was praying wrong. I was just trying to ask God to do things for me rather than seeing how I could partner with him in times of struggling. And it wasn't until that where I, um, it wasn't until that happened that I was able to be a part of a really great thing on my college campus. Um, First, I had to talk to someone about it. I had to let someone know what was going on. And they really helped me through it. And we found that as I talked about it, we knew other people that, was, that were struggling with the same things. All right? And I think a lot of times when we're suffering, we think that we're all alone and that no one can help us. But friends, like, we are meant to be in community with each other. And so when we talk about it and when we vocalize what's going on, we don't, we don't give power to it. We show that our community is stronger, that our God is stronger. And so I talked about it. And through these friends that were struggling with the same thing, we realized, hey, like we have an understanding now that God isn't just making us suffer just to suffer. He's doing something in the suffering. And he's doing something um, beyond the suffering. And we said, okay, like we need to seek God during this time because we need to know how he's moving. We need, we need to know what he's planning on doing. And the moment we realized, we re re we realized that within three weeks' time, there would be a youth conference happening at our college campus. Um, and we were expecting 3,000 students to show up, and we realized, God, like, we know you're going to do something great, so we need to start fighting with spiritual disciplines in order uh, to make sure that, like, this happens and that you move. So um, I think prayer and uh, reading scripture are really great. I also think they're kind of those Sunday school answers. Um, they're kind of really easy to say. Um, they're a lot harder to do. My friends and I really devoted ourselves to that. We also devoted ourselves to fasting. Um, we started a 21-day fast for those next three weeks. Some people went um, without food for 21 days. Um, other people went out without social media. I cut out zebra cakes. Um, you know, <laughs> fasting was different for all of us. We all have different abilities. My zebra cakes was my limit. Um, 
But about, in three weeks' time, when that conference came about, um, we had 3,000 uh, youth kids on campus, and we had 1,000 of them pledge to tell one person about Jesus. So think about this. Um, we, we had this awareness that God was going to do something, and we, we were obedient to it, and like, we had that suffering in it. But we chose to seek God through that. We chose to talk to others about what was going on in their life. And because of that, a thousand people were given a gospel message. Suffering is not something that's meant to just, like, make us stuck somewhere. Suffering is meant for something more. And God doesn't use suffering to punish us. He uses it to teach us and equip us and empower us. And we're going to continue this conversation on suffering in our small groups. And we're going to really wrestle with this idea of how suffering is really hard, but God is good. So um, if you guys would pray with me, and then we'll go to small groups. God, we thank you for this time where we get to discuss and we get to learn more about who you are. Um, I just ask that you would bless our small group conversations and that they would teach us and guide us in seeing more of who you are. Um, as we go throughout Summer Civil, I wish that you would come and just be present with us and that we would have a fun and safe time. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Thank you.